Hello, and welcome to Scientists Live here in the hidden collections of the section of anthropology at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We're actually so hidden, we're not at the main museum building in Pittsburgh's Oakland neighborhood, but we're off site in East Liberty. Now, some of our collections are here in storage in East Liberty, but you can also find us at the main museum. And my favorite exhibit is on the third floor, the Walton Hall of Ancient Egypt. Um, about 600 of our objects are on display in the Walton Hall, but there are nearly 2,000 here in storage, and we've brought out some here today. I am Dr. Erin Peters. I'm an assistant curator of science and research here at the Carnegie and lecturer of curatorial studies at the University of Pittsburgh. I am an Egyptologist, and I researched Egypt when it was a part of the Roman Empire. So I'm really excited today because we're going to be talking about a number of objects of different functions or uses of different materials and time periods and we're going to get to talk about my Romans uh, today too. So the first object I'd like to talk about is actually two here that transports us all the way back to about 4000 BCE. So this is about 6000 years ago. These are black topped red ware ceramic vessels and you see a larger one here a smaller one here I'm going to pick up. And these are so fabulous because the um, time period that we have, we see some um, uh, investigation and experimentation with different ceramic technologies. And you have this lovely bicolor look to the vessel where they were actually flipped over and the rim and part of the body here was put into some kind of organic material. And then this was left out exposed in the kiln. And that's how you get black topped red wear. Now we know that ceramic was used for, ceramic vessels were used for a number of functions in ancient Egypt. Sometimes um, things like drinking, like you might drink with this, or storage for food. Um, and we also know that they were made specifically for funerary contexts and put in graves. So some of these really lovely uh, ceramic vessels would have been a part of grave goods. Now, that also leads me to our next object. Very carefully put this down to this piece of wood, which might look a little unremarkable, but I assure you it's not. It's actually really fabulous. And it's one of a few deck planks that we have here in storage of our nearly 4,000 year old royal funerary boat, which is on display in the Walton Hall of Ancient Egypt. Now, if you haven't seen it, you should, because this boat is almost 30 feet long. And you can imagine that this piece is just one of a small uh, piece of one of the deck planks. Now, it's really exciting. So one of four boats that were excavated at a pyramid complex of the Middle Kingdom Pharaoh Senwasra III, and one of four that's known in museum collections. And it's important as it's very rare for antiquity and what we can see with it, but it's also really exciting for right now. So we actually had colleagues here just last week researching this boat. The um, University of Arizona's Laboratory for Tree Ring Research, um, we had some, some fellows here doing dendrochronological sampling. And um, this is important to note with this deck plank, you can actually see that it's been sampled. Um, this one specifically was sampled in an earlier study in the 1980s. Um, but our guy is also sampled here. And you can see some of the, the shavings of the wood that we have numbered that are all part of the study of this boat. So keep tuned, stay tuned for new and exciting things happening with our funerary boat. And not just with current scientific research, but also we're really excited as we're currently the recipient of a National Endowment for Humanities Digital Project to the Public Grant, where we're hoping to do a kind of reinterpretation with our boat digitally. So now in our comments or our, our questions, please let us know what you would like to see with that boat. Uh, personally, I would like to see it like how it might have been used in antiquity and also how it might have looked, which is very different than what you see here and actually would have been completely painted, which is something that I'm really interested in. And it brings me to my favorite piece right here. So I hope you can see that there is quite a bit of lovely paint surviving on this limestone fragment. And I just have to digress a little bit and say I'm really excited about this because it's a part of, of what I do, what I research. It's a small fragment of a much larger scene from a temple. 
So probably, uh, we know it comes from the site of Abydos. It could possibly be the temple of Osiris there. And we know it's fragmentary. You can see it's cut. Um, and probably from the placement of the, the this is would be a part of a vulture that would have been going like this, the vulture wing. And then also a cartouche here. The placement of these things tell me that this is probably the top of a very, very large scene. I hope you can see that there's lovely black here. There's this um, green, we have a bit of red, and we have this yellow. And these are colors that are typical for the palette of the New Kingdom. And we know that this dates to Dynasty 18, which is the first dynasty of the New Kingdom, to the, I believe it's the sixth pharaoh, Thutmosis III, because of this cartouche. So now the cartouches are, um, basically ropes that then tie in the images for what make up the names of the kings. Of course, we know that all of these symbols are actually making up words. This is the ancient Egyptian language. So I'm gonna show you here, we have part of this cartouche that's then been um, basically, you know, removed from the other part um, that tells us that this is Tutmosis and this is his, um, his um, nomen or birth name that, um, Thoth, which is right here, actually the god, and then um, Moza, so born, um, so born of Thoth, and then we have in the middle here um, what's half of a, um, a scarab beetle, which would be um, Keperu, and then on this side would be another symbol, Nefer. And so we have the whole name here, which would have been um, one of Tathmosis III's names, and you can actually see this indicates here would be the, the son of Ra name, and you got a little half of a bird up here, which tells us that too. So well, really exciting um, about this is that it was found at, at Abydos, and it also comes from, and I'm just gonna kind of very carefully <laughs> turn around here, we see that we have other collections on our shelves, and there's another relief um, up here, also from the same site, and we actually, we pulled this out today, it came from, from this shelf here. So you can see where some of this stuff is coming from. Um, behind you are actually enclosed cabinets, um, but these are just out with um, different types of plastic covering the front. Okay, so now thinking about um, moving to another object coming from um, Abydos and also related to Thoth, so keep this in mind is a mummy. And I know you're just waiting for a mummy, and don't worry, we have two here, but I'm going to, again, very carefully pick up this mummy because it is an ibis mummy. And ibises were thought, um, were related to Thoth, and the Egyptians thought that the god actually manifested in this bird, in the ibis bird. And so we have this, and I hope you can see the absolutely a lovely uh, crafting of the linen here, and this dates from the Roman period, my very favorite period, um, and comes from Abydos. And we know it comes from the Ibis Cemetery at Abydos because we have amazing records from where a lot of our collections come from. And this was excavated as part of the Egypt Exploration Fund, which was a group founded in the late 1800s in London, that different organizations or individuals could be um, basically a members to and they would submit money and then be a part of funding excavations, of publishing those excavations, and then get a portion, a portion of the fines. And from the very beginning, Andrew Carnegie was a part of, in the, in the larger museum, was a part of the Egypt Exploration Fund. So this was actually excavated in 1900, and we got it just a few years later as part of those fines. Now thinking about that, this mummy, our relief that I already talked about, up here. And these pots are all a part of excavations from the Egypt Exploration Fund, which took place over um, a number of decades. And that also leads me the next object, which I'm going to point very carefully over here to this uh, archival box. And inside it is very exciting. Um, this note and then a number of ancient coins. I'm showing you just a little, it's hard to see I'm sure any kind of specific detail, but I'm gonna read you this note because I think it's really cool. Coins in this tray are part of a hoard of 4,000 coins found in three large jars in the cellar of a house at Umm el Atal, Egypt, about 1900, by Messrs. Grenfell, Hunt, and Hogarth. 
And those three are very important Egyptologists and were a part of, um, again, the Egypt Exploration Fund and the, the process that went about excavating these coins. Um, we know that Um El Atal is in the, I believe, the northeast of the Fayum, which is uh, a west a bit and a bit south of modern day Cairo. And it was a very important site in the Roman period. And what's very exciting about these coins for me is that we have a number of Roman emperors uh, represented. And I can show you this coin here. This actually is a coin of the Roman emperor Hadrian. So besides Augustus, who is actually my favorite Roman emperor, Hadrian's my second favorite emperor, and um, he reigned from about 117 to I think it's 136 CE. So this is after the year one. And we can see here on this coin, on this side, we actually have the profile of the emperor with a laurel wreath. That's very common for, for coins in the Roman period. And um, Hadrian is very exciting because he is one of the Roman emperors uh, and pharaohs in Egypt that actually came to Egypt. And he came in uh, 130 CE. And something very exciting and sort of wild happened, which was that he had a companion with him named Antinous, who apparently fell off their boat in the Nile River and drowned. And then so because of Egyptian beliefs, was actually deified after death. And Hadrian founded an ancient a city for him, so Antonopolis, so the city of Antinous. And this is actually the site that I have been excavating at this year and will be hopefully returning to next year. And this, I said, I hope I said it was 130 CE. So what's really exciting about these coins is they can tell us so much about the ancient world. Um, and something important about monetary um, and you know, socioeconomic relations, before the Romans, the, uh, the Ptolemies, who were the Greek rulers of the famed Cleopatra, actually introduced um, so coinage as money in Egypt. Before that, it was more of a barter and trade system with, um, with major goods and time and resources, etc. And one of the things that was a major good was actually linen, along with grain, of course, for eating. And that kind of takes me to this amazing object. It dates much later in time, but it is linen. And I'm very excited to be able to show you this because we do not have any of the, these on display because they're so fragile. This is um, a linen and wool Coptic textile. So you can see here that the, um, the Copts, which, were, um, which are Christian Egyptians, uh, this probably dates definitely after the third century. Um, and the Copts used really brilliant and amazing weaving. And we have a number of different patterns that tell us a lot about early Christianity um, in the world. And also, this is such an amazing connector to ancient Egypt, to, to modern Egypt, and to, to right now Egypt. Um, so we have a number of um, cops, I understand, actually, in the Pittsburgh area. And I think about 10% of Egypt's population is Coptic uh, today. So all of these objects really connect us to ourselves, connect us to the world around us. They connect us to the ancient world, to our contemporary world. We can learn amazing scientific information. We can learn amazing things about people. And they're just really wonderful um, to be around. And I'm really thrilled to have discussed them with you. So I think there's a time now for some questions coming in from the Facebook. What are some of the most exciting things you've found at a site? Ah, that is a really great question. So when I was in Egypt this February at Antonopolis, we were working um, at two different open areas at the site. Um, three actually, but I was only involved with two of them. And we had a test trench laid for what we thought through ground penetrating radar we would find a building, which I, I work on buildings, which is why I was there. Um, but we ended up actually finding uh, a number of animal bones and human bones. And we didn't end up finding a building. And so what was so interesting about the, the bones that we found is, is what they were doing there. And also how they were laid in certain different areas and the the um, combination, particularly of different animals. We had a number of cows, which are 
quite usual and you would expect, but we also had a crocodile skeleton, which was really cool. So I say that would be the most exciting thing that I think of right away um, about what founding, found on site. And I think we're gonna get one more. <laughs> what did they use to make pigments? Oh, that's a really great question. They used a lot of natural material, but the coolest thing about, I think, one of the coolest things <laughs> about ancient Egypt is they actually were the first to make synthetic pigment. So surprisingly enough on this relief, you don't see any blue. And I say surprisingly enough because the pigment, Egyptian blue, which is the earliest synthetic made pigment, is really, really sturdy and tends to hang on to things way more than other types of pigments, especially green. So it's really surprising that we have some here. Um, but they used a lot of different, as I mentioned, minerals, and then they used, um, they combined them with different earth elements as well. And then they would put them together with like gum binders, et cetera, to be able to make, make the pigment. What was the name of the currency? Also great. And I was thinking you mean name, like the type. So this is, and uh, I have a couple, they're all the same type. They are a tetradrachm, um, a billion, which is uh, about, I think 20, at least less than 20% silver. So a tetradrachm is actually the equivalent of four drachmae. And what's really interesting too, I mentioned that the Ptolemies, who were the Greek rulers um, in Egypt, introduced um, currency in Egypt were Greek. And so this is a uh, drachmae, or actually a, a Greek form of currency. And in other parts of the Roman Empire, they were using different types of money, like the denarius. Um, but in Egypt, the coinage was Greek. The language, actually, the administrative language in Roman Egypt was actually Greek too. But there were a number of languages spoken in Egypt. Um, it's just the administrative language. So there was actually, we have very few Latin documents that come from Egypt, which is really interesting. And then the, the language on here, just to note, is, is also Greek. Ah, uh, oh, that's a really good question. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm going to take the middle one. <laughs> what began your interest in studying Egypt? Uh, that is a great question. I got the bug through um, my school and our session, um, our curriculum, we studied Egypt in sixth grade. And we had this amazing assignment where we had to take on the persona and the role of an Egyptian god or goddess. And I, um, then you had to dress up like the god or goddess. And then you had to write a poem in the guise of that god or goddess. And then we had to actually go around the school in our costumes to walk like an Egyptian, which was amazing and also really frightening because we were in sixth grade and there were a lot of eighth graders there and that was really frightening, but also amazing, like I said. So we had to do this amazing assignment and also my mom is an art teacher and she was doing an assignment on create your own sarcophagus at the same time that I was creating my own poem and I was the goddess Nephthys, if you're curious. Um, and I was out um, helping with her. She was at a different teaching at a different school than I was a student. And I was helping with her art exhibit. And I just, that was it for me, it was the create your own sarcophagus and also be a god or goddess. What did you do to become an Egyptologist? You need to love ancient Egypt and modern Egypt. And then you'll have the bug that will carry you all through lots of schooling <laughs> and lots of different language preparation and excavating, um, and then you get to be around amazing objects like this. Maybe we can take one or two more. Do you have a favorite Egyptian god or goddess? Oh, that's a good question too. Oh, that's a hard one. Mm. I don't actually think I could pick a favorite, um, but I can say one of the things that really excites me about Egyptian religion and gods and, and goddesses in general is that they all have so many different qualities um, that they were associated with. And a number of times they might seem kind of contradictory, which really helps us think about the way the Egyptians thought and understand the world. So Egyptians really thought of things as going together. So um, Egypt itself is, is red land and black land, and you can't have 
red land without the black land. The red land is um, the desert, as you would imagine, and the black land is the fertile land, the, the maritime land in the middle on the Nile River. And those things together make Egypt. For a goddess, for instance, you have um, the goddess Sekhmet, who was a lioness goddess, and she was you know, very motherly, but also could be very fierce at the same time. So I think really exciting things. Um, the Egyptians understood their world in really fantastic and smart ways. Um, that's what makes me think about god or goddesses. But we, quickly, because I was thinking I might just talk about this. So here we have what might be a hawk mummy, but I thought it was really exciting just to show the kinds of um, materials and the ways that we care for objects in storage and they're what we call supports. So I hope you can see, this is quite complex. So we have things like Q-tips, right? Uh, we have ethafoam here, and we have this really um, complex way of putting this object um, in its storage so that it's, it's safe um, for perpetuity. And you can see that a little bit with our um, blacktop redware over here and our ibis mummy back here. Um, and then we also, this of course would be wrapped up, it's just open so that you can see it, um, in archival material. Um, so that keeps us, keeps the collection safe. Okay, well this has been such a pleasure and I thank you. I hope that you will come to Carnegie Museum of Natural History and experience ancient Egypt with us. And thank you so much.